I think we're going to kill thousands of people. The aliens are here and your whole plan is broken and you need a new plan. It just seemed like a kind of out of control movie. You are going to have to look down. But there is no lockdown plan. All right, you already. Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase? I'm Chase Hughes, and I'm mouth internally Mark Bowden's introduction every time he says it, but also <laughs> did 20 too. years in the U.S. military. I wrote the number one best-selling book on influence, persuasion, and behavior profiling. Nowadays, I teach extreme influence, behavior profiling, and people reading to the general public and intelligence agencies. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, and put together this number one online course, bodylanguagetactics.com with Scott. I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. Excellent. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, Dominic Cummings and Mark found it. So Mark, why don't you tell us about Dominic? Yeah, so Dominic Cummings, uh, lots of people in the UK have been asking for this actually from way back uh, at the start of COVID. It just so happens recently, Cummings went up in front of what's called a select committee, which is a part of parliament that gets to question you as to what on earth went on somewhere recently. Dominic Cummings was the chief advisor to the UK prime minister, Boris Johnson, until recently where they split ways. Uh, arguably, he was one of, if probably the second most powerful person in, in British politics behind the Prime Minister. He's a notorious character, notorious for uh, creating the take back control uh, motto, which some but not all of Britain got behind in order for the Brexit for, for Britain to come out of Europe. So notor notorious character and in the videos that we're watching, uh, he's talking about what happened uh, in cabinet meetings during uh, the COVID uh, health crisis. There you go. Okay, great. Now, Greg, do you want to add something to that? So to keep yeah, us I off think, from thinking um, this is going to get a little bit boring? Yeah, I don't think this is boring at all, guys. I would say what Chase and I come from a human intelligence collector background. And when we say interrogator, that's one form of human intelligence collection. Another is debriefing. And this is a dream. You get a guy who defects, in effect, and is going to tell you everything that happened. We get more intelligence from foreign governments by debriefing, by talking to a guy, reading his body language and listening, than we do by far from a, a hostile interrogation. So Pay attention. This is a really good opportunity to hear the inner workings of something very complex. And as Mark said, second most powerful guy in British government. All right. All right. Well, we've got uh, 10 little videos to take a look at. And what we do here, we just tell you what we're seeing. That's it. It doesn't mean this person is innocent. doesn't mean they're guilty. doesn't mean they're lying. doesn't mean they're telling the truth. We're just telling you what we see from our perspective, our different perspectives in their body language. That's it. All right. You guys ready? Yeah. Here we go. The truth is that senior ministers, senior officials, senior advisors like me fell disastrously short of the standards that the public has a right to expect of its government in a crisis like this. When the public needed us most, the government failed. And I'd like to say to all the families of those who, uh, who died unnecessarily how sorry I am for the mistakes that were made and for my own mistakes at that. All right. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, we, we're seeing a whole lot of honest stuff here. This guy has been in this political realm since 1999, and he's been doing this stuff for a very long time. I've studied his work. Uh, he approaches a lot of this stuff from a very psychological perspective. He got his start studying this guy named John Boyd, and he was an, uh, an American military fighter pilot who invented the OODA loop. And so he started studying this stuff. This is a way that police officers can understand the, the process of how we think in critical times. And uh, we already see, so just as a behavior profiler, I'm instantly seeing this is a right-handed person. So I'm looking for things with the right hand. I'm gonna, I know that when I see that person's dominant shoulder go back in a conversation, 
that could could indicate that they're in, in very strong disagreement with what's being said. I think his shirt is deliberate. He he knows exactly what he's doing. He's opened up his button. He's rolled his sleeves up to identify with the most amount of common people that he can. And when he's saying the government failed, these other people failed, he's using team focused pronouns. We, this group failed. And that's pretty common. So the collective failed, not just me. I want to reassure you that everybody screwed up, that it, that it wasn't just me. Uh, Scott? All right. I think what we're seeing here is an apology. And I think it's a sincere apology. And I think he's feeling this. And we know that because as he's speaking, you can, you can hear his voice quiver. You know, one of those things where you're about to start crying. You can do that. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an art to be able to pull that off. Um, so it's believable. believable. But, it, but you can do that, but I don't think that's what we're seeing here. He's showing, he's showing the, the, um, the classics of being humbled. He's got his head down. His shoulders are up. He's almost turtling like you'll see somebody who's doing something they shouldn't suppose, they, they're not supposed to be doing in a store and they're stealing things or something like that. So you see him trying to make himself smaller because I really do think he's feeling this. Um, and his hands are together almost like he's in prayer as he's doing this they're they're not moving much at all and they're, they're together and his head is down and he's he's almost begging for it looks like he's begging for forgiveness forgiveness in a way um we see just a hint of the grief muscle so that shows that he's that he's actually feeling this as he goes along it denotes that and the voice the volume of his voice and the tone is different from everywhere else we'll see it one more spot in here just for just briefly i'll point that out but it changes from this point forward his vocal to tone and the timbre of his voice as well. Um, he's using his head as illustrators. And this is this is one of the only times, I think he does it three times throughout this, that he uses just his head as an illustrator. Not through the whole, not through the whole of the other videos I'm talking about, but in the beginnings of them, and we'll go over that as well. Um, yeah, and we're not really seeing uh, some somebody may call the adapters his hands together like this and moving around, but I think he's just I think they're just together. He's not even thinking about it. I don't think he's adapting at that point. I could be wrong. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, so I think, you know, what we're seeing in, in could be adapters here might be just a little bit of self-stimulation, a little bit of, of, of self-stimulation just to keep himself buoyant and psychologically um, uh, optimistic about what what's happening here. This question especially is a bit of a, a threat to him because you're right, Scott, this is a moment of apology. And I think what the British public want to know about this is, is it a genuine apology? Does is, does Dom really actually, you know, mean this? Um, let's come to that in a moment. But I want to go back to what Chase was saying, which is the shirt. And yeah, the shirt is is classic for him in that everybody you're going to hear from in these interviews and everybody talked about went to one of two universities in the UK. Everybody knows every, everybody else and Dominic did go to those same universities. However, he sees himself, I think, as a bit of an outsider from the usual political group. Uh, he's a little bit out there, thinks a little bit differently and so even if he deems to show up for select committee, and I think this is the only time he's gone, yeah, I'll show up and uh, and you can ask me some questions. He shows with his buttons undone and his sleeves rolled up to kind of go, I don't think I'm really from your group. Kind of is. But he's almost playing the Northern English idea. He's from Durham, north of England, not from the south. There's a bit of div divide going on there. So, you know, two very different groups there. Yeah, so uh, turtling, I, I agree. I think we are seeing some of that. It isn't just his position. I think he, he truly is turtling there. Uh, downcast eyes, I think we are seeing a bit of shame there. There's some monitors down there, so sometimes we will see him looking down. That's when he's trying to make contact with a specific group of people who are on those monitors and aren't in the array in front of him. Um, we see stress, that swallow reflex uh, a little bit. Um, how, how sorry I am, and he, he bat on gestures with his finger there, how sorry I am. So there's some stress on that as well. That would suggest uh, that there's, there's congruence there. He truly is sorry. Voice crack on the idea of the families, so the, the, the bereaved, so that, that, that sense of emotion around the bereaved. And yes, so, somewhat 
uh, grief in the forehead. Maybe not as pronounced as it as it could be, but I think it's there. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Do you see that? I did. I saw the little grief muscle when he said died. When that part hit, there's clearly a little grief muscle. He does a request for approval there as well, raises his brow like a child when they're doing something and they're asking you for approval, they raise their head. Doesn't mean they're lying. They use it at different times. They may just wait to see what you think. And you see that brow drop immediately. I saw some eye blocking, his blink rate increased. You could see emotion welling up. Not a lot, but you could hear as he went on about saying whatever this, you know, like me, when he went to blame sharing is what I call that in corporate America every day. We, 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 when things go wrong, I, 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 when things go great. In this case, he goes like me. And I, I do believe it's genuine. There's some shallow breathing associated with it as well. And he's blocking his eyes as he looks down. I think there's shame associated. I think it's a, an apology, just like you guys said. Cool. The truth is that senior ministers, senior officials, senior advisors like me fell disastrously short of the standards that the public has a right to expect of its government in a crisis like this. When the public needed us most, the government failed. And I'd like to say to all the families of those who, uh, who died unnecessarily how sorry I am for the mistakes that were made and for my own mistakes at that. All right. We good? Yeah. Thanks. Here we go. In, in February, the Prime Minister regarded this as um, just a, a scare story. He, he regarded, he d described it as the new swine flu. Did you tell him it wasn't? S certainly. But the view of various officials inside Number 10 was, um, if we have the Prime Minister chairing Cobra meetings and he just tells everyone, it's swine flu, don't worry about it, I'm going to get Chris Whitty to inject me live on TV with coronavirus so everyone realises... It's nothing to be frightened of. That would be, that would not help. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm interested in the idea that he says, instead of uh, saying yes, he says certainly. It's a bit close to sometimes the idea of absolutely. So, so there seems to be a little extra force on this idea and just instead of just saying yes he goes for certainly he's laboring it a little bit more putting a little bit more pressure on this idea i'm interested in that um look uh, we, we our eyes focus on what is valuable our eyes focus on what is highest rank highest status what's most valuable our eyes look to the light rather than the dark often and what i want you to look out for is exactly where his eyes are going to which is in his view, the two highest ranking people who are uh, there interviewing him, uh, which is uh, Greg Clark and Jeremy Hunt. Both are, are co-chairs of this committee, but both of them are rivals. And one of them is implicated somewhat in this, in that one of them, Jeremy Hunt, used to run the health service. And the health service under somebody else's ownership is being implicated. But the implication could go back in time. People weren't ready for this. There was no plan. And, and that having no plan could go back to, to Jeremy Hunt. So I think we're going to, those shifty eyes are not about, hey, is this person telling us the, us the truth? Are they lying? It's about them looking for the response of the two highest ranking people there and some, some potential targets, certainly one potential target there. Um, yeah, but I would say when it comes to this idea of, of, of Chris Whitty, um, you know, the idea that Chris Whitty, who was the uh, the chief surgeon uh, for the UK going live on TV and, and injecting Boris Johnson as kind of a, uh, a stunt um, to kind of, uh, which Boris is just a, you know, brilliant stunt guy, brilliant, brilliant marketeer, brilliant stunt guy. Um, that idea of, is that true? Was that going to happen? What I would suggest, and I'd like to hear from Scott on this, is, is there seems to be a rhythm there. I mean, Scott always talks about loping. There seems to be a good rhythm to that. It seems to be a story that rolls along quite well, rather than a story of, let me make this up on, on the spot, or I've made up this story, let me deliver that story now. Seems to roll along. Uh, but Scott, what have you got on it? What do you, what do you think? I agree with it completely because he's telling a story 
and not a story that he's made up. He's telling, he's relaying what has happened. And we know this because of what you're saying, Mark. Perfect. It's a great call on that. His loping. He's talking in this rhythm that we're going to see him talk throughout this whole thing in. He hasn't just gotten in a thing and talking like this and da 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 da. He's actually kind of, it's just, it's like you're riding a horse. It's, it's loping as, you know, through a field or whatever. So, yeah, that's great. And that's one of the things that, that you first start listening for, as you know. And another thing is, um, a lot of people are going to say that his head shake when he's doing this, that's the, that he's not telling the truth because he's saying no as he's giving us information. This is what I, this, this is what I call the nothing more than head shake when they say there's nothing more than this there. That's what we're seeing there because that's what's pretty much going through his mind as he's relaying this information. There's nothing more than this. It's very simple what he's saying. We go on to find out there's a lot of, uh, it's complex and he explained the way he explains it. It's fascinating. It's great. But that, so that, that's another thing. We see the, um, the fidgeting with a pin, and that, and in this, in this case, it shows, like when, um, when you goof around with yours, Mark. Yours is is focus. It's not because you're trying to get rid of some weird, you know, thing you've got pent up. But you'll spin it in your fingers, and you'll just be talking. And it's just because you're doing it. It just it helps you focus on that, kind of like a fidget spinner, I guess. Um, now, having said all that, his posture seems a little more relaxed than it did. In the video before this so it's it's more of a um and we'll see his posture change quite a bit in here because there's a lot going on as it should when you're telling the story and the different parts come up when you begin when you start talking real seriously you lean forward that head comes out and you start getting the head to going we're seeing all these things in here that's why i still i'm still hanging with he's he's telling the truth here um what else have i got um and, and here his voice tone is a little bit low, a little bit lower than it was. And a lot of times when people are telling you something really serious and you're in trouble or something's happened, that voice will go low, but it'll stay strong as it did in this case. So that's what I got. Greg, what do you got? So when I watch him, I see a little bit of downright eye accessing and whether this matters to him or not, there's some emotion associated when we look at things down into our right. And I'm looking Mark as well to make sure he's not breaking eye contact to look at someone else. I also am a big believer that the way a person's voice sounds matters because you can all finish this. You can finish this sentence. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. There's a break from everything else he says here when he says certainly everything else and not just in this interview, but in the rest of it as well. That certainly to me is a little snarky. It's a little, well, what do you think? It's more of that than it's kind of a the lilt to the end. What do, who do I look like is kind of what I hear there when I hear that little lilt to the voice. So a little bit of contempt there. But of course, I don't I don't know British politics from, you know, Alabama politics or, or Kentucky politics. So I don't know exactly how much contempt that would lead to. Um, his blink rate does indicate he's got a little bit of heightened fight or flight when it gets to the point they're starting to ask him pointed questions. One thing you should note is just because a person has fight or flight doesn't mean they're lying. It can mean that there's a dog barking in the background or it can mean that there's Sorry, another guys. that's okay, okay. Yeah. no keep going it's keep going it's fine It'll just fine. keep going it works it works chase it's fine man chase we're good man this will be good anyway it also <laughs> can mean there's something going on in your head about something else this is why we can't say we're reading your mind it's not what we're doing we're looking for indicators something's going on and here what i see is more of him coming in to tell a story that has some stress associated with it and when you ask him, did you tell him? Well, of course I did. Nothing more than that. That's all I got. All right. When Chase comes cool. back. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> Other than a dog. <laughs> Other than a dog. Mine's here. Hattie fat. Come here. Come here. Come here. Well, mine, mine have been outside making a lot of noise is why I knew the guy who's working on the house was leaving. That's why I had to get up and oh. go earlier. <laughs> the dog is clearly being kenneled. Poor guy. Sorry, I got a big sign on the door that says do not knock live on air and there's someone pounding on the door. <laughs> of, course. of course. What are you going to do? So. <laughs> All, right. All right, you ready? Yep. Throw it on over to Chase. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think this was mostly honest. Uh, I agree with you guys. One of the big things here that we see is his arm is out on the chair. He's got another arm that's kind of out here. We see elbow distance from the body. And one thing that fear makes our bodies do, the number one thing that fear makes our bodies do is protect arteries. That's why we have turtling. That's why this muscle sticks out here and comes in front of the carotid artery. 
all of that stuff shows us that his body is either lacking fear or he has had a ton of training and he's definitely fooled me. So I don't think there's much fear here. I do think there's a narrative. I think he is pushing a narrative. He's choosing his words very carefully to paint a picture. But I, I also think that, that that doesn't mean that this is deceptive. That doesn't mean the statements are deceptive. So I think he's telling the truth. And, you know, Greg and I are both, I think I would call myself a brainwashing expert. And we're doing this stuff. There are very specific ways. When we do trial consulting, we're teaching someone how to how to be deposed. We're teaching someone how to conduct a, dep a deposition effectively. Uh, all of that stuff is still truthful. We're just wording it a certain way so that structure, story, character arc, all of this stuff uh, spins a certain emotional tale in the listener's head. That's all I got. Very cool. In, in February, the Prime Minister regarded this as um, just a, a scare story. He, he regarded, he d described it as the new swine flu. Did you tell him it wasn't? S certainly. But the view of various officials inside Number 10 was, um, if we have the Prime Minister chair in Cobra meetings and he just tells everyone, it's swine flu, don't worry about it, I'm going to get Chris Whitty to inject me live on TV with coronavirus so everyone realises it's nothing to be frightened of, that would be, that would not help. All right, we good? Yep. All right. At this point, the second most powerful official in the country, Helen McNamara, is the Deputy Cabinet Secretary. She walked into the office while we're looking at this whiteboard. She says, I've just been talking to the official, Mark Sweeney, who is in charge of coordinating with the Department for Health. He said, quote, I've been told for years that there is a whole plan for this. There is no plan. We're in huge trouble. I've come through here to the, Helen McNamara said, I've come through here to the Prime Minister's office to tell you all, quote, I think we are absolutely I think this country is heading for a disaster. I think we're going to kill thousands of people. As soon as I've been told this, I've come through to see you. It seems from the conversation that you're having that that's correct. And I said, I think you're right. I think it is a disaster. All right, Greg, what do you got? I agree with everything you guys have said to now. There's storytelling. And this is a great example of storytelling. This is, I came prepared to tell you this story. In fact, I'm even going to anchor it with some high holy ground folks. Here's the second most powerful person. Here's this other person. And I'm going to use quotes. You don't come in ill-prepared with quotes. You could say, kind of said this, but when you say quote and you're in front of a government body, you're probably locking yourself down to being held accountable for saying that. So you watch that as he starts telling his stories, loping along, he hits that holy ground. He comes up, he, he makes real eye contact, does a quick request for approval, but not the kind that says, I'm lying, but the kind that says, are you with me? This is the entire crux of everything we're going to see moving from here. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I absolutely agree. We've got we've got uh, uh, emphatic downward gestures on this. So this, all of this, is all really key points. And you might think, well, this is key points for the select committee. It's not. It's key points for the public. And the reason is, the select committee know exactly who Helen McNamara is. The, they don't they don't need an explanation of exactly who Helen McNamara is, but the general public wouldn't really know who one of the most uh, powerful uh, civil servants in the UK was at that time. And so the public, we need informing of that. And and Dominic knows that. So that's what he's he's trying to get it through to us, the public, because he doesn't usually show up at these things. He showed up for a specific reason, which is I'm going to tell the public who was there on what date, exactly what they said, and the public will hear it from me rather than through the filter of government and the the press. Now, I would say, however, that the voice does crack on uh, kill thousands of people. So again, I would say it's not that you can't do that on purpose, but it's tough to do to do that one and get it just right. And I think it's it, it's good. It's it's subtle. 
and it's in the right place. And he runs out of breath at the end as well, which I think to your point, Greg, it does suggest to me something is rehearsed about this because usually the body will work in, in a much more natural way with the mind and won't give you sentences that are too long. It's almost like he's gone through this. Here's what I'm going to say. Here's what I'm going to mention. Oh, I should have rehearsed this under pressure because I've gone and run out of breath and I've got to swallow and take another one and get that last bit in. So rehearsed, prepared, I, I think emphatic, uh, instructional for, for, the, for the public as to what uh, happened. But I think an element there of, of sincerity still around uh, kill thousands of people. Chase, what do you think? Yep, I agree with the guest. That was emotive and his gestures move with his words. We also saw that he puts positive things. He's starting to sort positive things off to his right side. That's important for us as we're interviewing a person to be able to say, oh, that's the side that they reference positive things. And if they all of a sudden they're talking about something negative and their hands go over here and they say, oh, it was a horrible experience or, oh, it was a great relationship. That's something to pay attention to because that's a change in hemisphere, left and right hemisphere. There is, uh, he starts using the word disaster, I think is his own word. And he uses this a few times. You're going to see this again. Anytime someone describes something negatively, the words they use, if you're in sales, if you're a parent, the words they use to describe anything negative and positive need to go in your pocket. And, and that's how you're going to describe taking action on something or maybe you describe a relationship with your competitor that way. Who knows? Or maybe the consequences of not taking action. And he uses uh, powerful in his descriptions quite a bit. I think this is a person who is very concerned with hierarchy and status. And not just that he wants to convey that to the public. He wants to convey that to the public because he thinks that way as well. And all of us, if you secretly want to know how someone thinks, ask them how they think most people view a certain thing, because we all tend to think that most people think like we do. And I think the overall story here is I agreed with the right people. And that and that's what we're really seeing here. I agreed with the right people. And that's all I got. Scott. All right. Well, we're seeing and relay facts. And that's pretty, that's pretty much all that's going on in this, in, in my point of view, from, from my perspective in this, because he's got the illustrators that are getting big at this point. They're almost on every word, like Mark was saying earlier, they're ding, 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 no matter what he's saying, that's all a big deal to him. He's emphasizing these specific words and phrases. Now, as he goes along, the, the, these illustrators hit every several words they'll hit because he's giving a complete thought and hitting on those complete thoughts as he does it. As we know, illustrators are what people use to, their brain emphasizes specific words and or phrases as you go along like I just did then. Um, and that's when his fingers hit the table as well, Mark. You're, you're a good call on that. Um, and now he begins at his left when he's, when, when he's talking about the past and he goes to the right when he's talking about the future. And as he's going through this timeline and telling the story, he says, this is what happened here. When so-and-so and so-and-so said this, then, they, then this happened. Then they'll say, but when this happened, and they'll come something before that. So that that whole the, using your your hands to show where you are in that in the timeline is used there as well, which and I think that's what makes him a, a great communicator. I think this guy will end up if he if he's not known as it already, which I think Mark has pretty much said he's a great, he's known as a great uh, communicator, not the great communicator, but a great communicator. Um, he's got a good vocal tone when he's re, when he's relaying what people have said. When he starts getting close to, if not quoting, if he's, when he does quote it, yeah, he leans into it. But at this point, he's, he's using a good, strong vocal tone as he goes in, as Greg was talking about earlier, about having a, the way someone sounds when they're, when they're telling a story. And I think Mark brought that up as well. That there, as he goes through, he, it's strong when he's come through there. He believes this because it happened. And so he's just relaying what happened. It's easy for him to do. That's why it's coming out like that, I believe, from my point of view. Um, He's not he's not exaggerating anything. There are no words, no words of exaggeration. Very huge, you know, monstrous, nothing big, nothing sounds out of whack. He's just go, cutting right along in that same loping manner, just telling you what happened. Um, 
his head is down, like he's telling you something again, like here's what here's here's why you're in trouble, that kind of thing. So his head's forward and he's giving this information. And it's not that he can't wait to give it. He wants to give it bad, but he's sure of it. And he wants you to know that he's sure of it. And that's how that's done, that he's serious about it. If you're talking to a child, it's saying you shouldn't have done that. And here's why you shouldn't have done it. If you're talking to the tax guy and he goes, this is where you messed up. They'll lean in and tell you that. Um, I think this I think this is real. Everything we're seeing is real. I think he's being truthful up at this point. I, I don't see any deception at all in here. This will be if you're looking for deceptive uh, cues and, and tells. I, I don't think we're seeing them one, not even a little bit. That's all I got. We good? Yeah, it's good. That was great. At this point, the second most powerful official in the country, Helen McNamara, is the deputy cabinet secretary. She walked into the office while we're looking at this whiteboard. She says, I've just been talking to the official, Mark Sweeney, who is in charge of coordinating with the Department for Health. He said, quote, I've been told for years that there is a whole plan for this. There is no plan. We're in huge trouble. I've come through here to the, Helen McNamara said, I've come through here to the Prime Minister's office to tell you all, quote, I think we are absolutely I think this country is heading for a disaster. I think we're going to kill thousands of people. As soon as I've been told this, I've come through to see you. It seems from the conversation that you're having that that's correct. And I said, I think you're right. I think it is a disaster. No doubt at all that many senior people um, performed far, far disastrously below the standards which the country has a right to expect. I think that the Secretary of State for Health is certainly one of those people. I said repeatedly to the Prime Minister that he should be fired. All right. Then, uh, Greg, what do you got? So when I watch this one, we're talking about telling a story. He's still telling a story and he's throwing people under the bus, but he's throwing his colleagues under the bus. And so there's no, regardless of what your purpose is, if you're here to torpedo someone career-wise or that, you're still associated with them. It would be like me coming out and attacking the three of you and saying, going in public and saying, hey, all those guys are this. Well, you still have shame or embarrassment when that happens. And I typically tell people to look for energy, direction, and focus to pick up on emotions. Mm -hmm. So energy is either low or high, direction is either sharp or scattered, and then focus is internal or external. In his case, his energy is low, his direction is very sharp, and his focus is internal, and that's embarrassment or shame. You can see it, you can see his body language close up, regardless of whether he's trying to hurt someone else or not, he's certainly feeling it himself, and you can see he has a barrier up and he's adapting, he's releasing nervous energy. His chin is down. We, we typically, when we say embarrassment, you may look away and break eye contact, but shame, your chin covers your throat. So it's what I see. It doesn't matter whether he has a, an ulterior motive or not, still a human being, still has those kinds of things. Now, I'll leave it to Mark to tell us what, what his motive may be, because Mark is much smarter about that kind of stuff than I am. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so we're hearing him use disaster again, disastrous, and using his own words. So we're kind of confirming we're seeing that that's a, that's a big deal to him. I think there is still we can see a narrative present in all of this, that there's a desired outcome. So if. Uh, most of the time, what we want to convey, anytime I'm coaching a, a deponent or somebody who's about to be deposed or interviewed, the the need to convey a lack of outcome dependency is very important, uh, especially to be trusted uh, by somebody, especially like in a courtroom setting or job interview. And I think uh, there's an upward tone. There's some eyebrow flash while delivering his line about should be fired and that's one of the few times that he goes upward at the end i think this is 95 percent truth and we see another confirmation again of his recollections and emotional recollections coming down here towards his uh, seven o'clock eye position and mark i'll pass it over to you yeah so um so i think what's interesting for me is is i think we're seeing again some self-stimulation on on the pen, around the pen, where he's digging his fingers in there. Uh, you know, basically, this is a a stressful, 
painful situation for him. If he can control some of that pain by delivering it to himself, he's going to feel a little more confident, a little bit more in charge. So I, I, I think that's what that pen action is about. Uh, look, in politics, you know, um, previous colleagues can become very expendable and and probably in the world of previous co colleagues probably matt hancock is relatively expendable so it's not too much of a problem to throw hancock under the bus what's interesting for me well first of all we get that far far d disastrously below so there's there's uh, you know a, a, a big idea of of how bad this was and that somebody should have been fired but i think his direction is 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 potentially down because the people on the screens in front of him are from the the um from the labor party side of the select committee or some of them are up here um a few more certainly high ranking conservative party select committee now um Cummings was working with the Conservative Party. That's not to say he couldn't go in all kinds of, of directions. You know, he was originally aligned with the, the, the I think, the Liberal Democrats at, at one point. So, so he could go kind of anywhere. But the people who could really ask for the resignation are the people down there. Those are the people he's trying to get to join in on this idea of, well, why don't we ask for Hancock's resignation right now? Because the moment you start picking people off, eventually you'll, there'll be nobody left supporting the top of the pyramid and the king falls, essentially. And this might be what it's about, is how you pick people off who are the supporters and who you get to do that so so the crown uh topples not the, not the actual crown in this specific sense but the uh the the top of the hierarchy anyway that's what i've got for you on that and and scott what do you got all right uh this like greg was saying goes back to similar um actions or acts that he's doing in the or positions he's in in the first video because he's looking apologetic he's looking he, he feels a little bit sorry about this he knows he's talking about incompetence because he's a part of it and i think that's where that's coming from so we're seeing him get kind of of uh he's pretty still on this as well again mark you nailed the pin fidgeting with a pen but something interesting and it's something that chase does a lot and he did it. if you'll roll this back and listen to chase's uh uh, what what he had on this stuff when you elongate the last word of a sentence or a phrase then that makes you pay attention it, it gets that person in and chase was doing it perfectly i was thinking about i was thinking about that as as you were doing that chase i was thinking about how i'm going to be how i'm going to word that and in this case this, this is the first time he starts as he goes through he uses a long word at the end of a sentence so it keep, keeps you hanging there, keeps you paying attention, because it makes you want to, to hear what he's going to do next. Magicians do a lot of things. And um, when they do, uh, like the sleight of hand stuff, I learned this. Um, when, they, when, they, when they'll be doing something, they'll, be, they'll, they'll start from, they'll take something from here. And if they took it from here to here, that's one thing. That you, you'll, you may look at their hand for a second as it moves. But when they do it at an arc, then your hand, then your brain goes, where's that hand going? So your brain keeps watching that hand as they're doing something over here. So I'm not saying that's what he's doing with his words, but th but that gets your attention just as that would get to that arc would get your attention, would hold your attention and make you think about what he's saying. Uh, his voice tone is strong, but and, and again, it's still between that video one and video two. It's not it's not over. It's not he's not leaning into it real hard because of the subject he's talking about. He's back a little bit, but he's still trying to be forceful as he's trying to be a part of this, of, of what he knows is uh, incompetence because he knows is a part of that. So that's what that seems like to me. And again, I'm seeing he's, tr he's being truthful here. I don't see any deception whatsoever, not even a little bit. No doubt at all that many senior people um, performed far, far disastrously below the standards which the country has a right to expect. I think that the Secretary of State for Health is certainly one of those people. I said repeatedly to the Prime Minister that he should be fired. We good? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. In accusing the Health Secretary of having lied, um, did I hear that correctly? Yes. 
Um, can you, that's obviously a serious charge, can you provide the committee with the, the evidence behind that assertion? Yes, I mean, um, in, in, uh, there, are, there are numerous examples. I mean, in the summer, he said that everyone who needed treatment, who uh, got the treatment that they required, he knew that that was a lie because he'd been briefed by the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer himself about the first peak, and we were told explicitly people did not get the treatment that they deserved. Many people were left to die in horrific circumstances. Is that the basis of your assertion? Are there other pieces? Of what, sorry? Of, is that the basis of your assertion, or are there other um, pieces of evidence that you base that, that charge on? Just before the Prime Minister and I were diagnosed with having COVID ourselves, the Secretary of State for Health told us in the Cabinet room, everything is fine on PPE. We've got it all covered, etc., etc. When I came back, almost the first meeting I had in the Cabinet room was about the disaster over, over PPE and how we were actually completely sure that hospitals all over the country were running out. The Secretary of State said in that meeting, this is the fault of Simon Stevens, it's the fault of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, it's not my fault, they've blocked approvals on all sorts of things. I said to the Cabinet Secretary, please investigate this and find out if it's true. The Cabinet Secretary came back to me and said, it's completely untrue, I have lost confidence in the Secretary of State's honesty in these meetings. The Cabinet and Secretary said the that. The Cabinet Secretary said that to me, and the Cabinet Secretary said that to 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 the Prime Minister. All right. Well, I'll go first on this one. Um, where he's he's got some internal dialogue going on. Nothing like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen? But he's thinking about what he's doing. It's not dawning on him what he's doing. But he's thinking about the gravity of the statements he's making. When this guy asked him if if that if he lied, and he and he's he agree, he says yes, he lied about that. That's why his, his hand is up. It's used, he's used it not only as an adapter, he's also using it as a barrier. And he doesn't move because he doesn't want to go, yes, he doesn't want to come blazing out of there because it, I think it, he believes it would look odd. I could be wrong about that, but that's what I would think. I mean, I would, I would stay in that position if, if someone asked me, especially if I was being serious about something. Uh, because that means I, because he's really focused on the guy who's talking. Who is that guy, Mark? Who's the guy? That's Greg Clark. Somebody, yeah, famous Greg Clark. guy over there? Okay. Um, yeah, famous-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So apparently, he has a lot of weight, and that would make that would make sense. Um, yeah. So he's really thinking about the the gravity of 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 what he's saying because he's tattling on that Secretary uh, of State of Health. How do they say that, Mark? What is it, the Secretary? Yeah, there's the Secretary of, of State for Health. For Health. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he's kind of. Uh, let him have it, <laughs> throwing him under the bus about that. And he knows he's going to catch a lot of flack for it. Uh, then we see he's, he's becoming a little bit indignant, and we see some disgust on it. If you're into micro expressions, go back through this because we're seeing a ton of them in there. And most of it is based around disgust because he's disgusted with that person, I believe. That's my, my uh, impression of it. Um, his eyes are, are really wide as, as he's going through that as well. And this, is, this denotes. Now, when somebody gets angry with you, a lot of times with it, you'll see squinted eyes, and they'll be like, oh, and you'll say, oh, okay, you, you, when you see the, the squinted eyes and somebody's all mad, that's, you know, you can relax. Nothing big is going to happen. But when the eyes are squinted and those eyes get, you can see the whites of their eyes as their eyes are squinting. That's what makes them look nuts. That's when somebody's really angry. This guy doesn't have the squinting part of that going, but he has the wide, his eyes wide open as he's, as he's, uh, as the anger builds in there. It's not uncommon, but it, 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 it happens quite a lot. So I, I, I'm under the impression he's fed up with this and he's angry and disgusted. Um, and now when he says, after he says the people were left to die in horrific circumstances, he's got his mouth open and an expression of almost, can you believe like, you know, his mouth's open, like, can you believe it? So I think that's important there because he really feels that goes back to the first video when he feels shame and he feels he's, he's apologizing for being a part of all this, uh, on his part. And I think we're seeing, again, I'm going to say I'm, we're seeing truth here. He's being truthful, and I don't see any deceptive anything in here, not even a little bit. Greg, what do you got? When you look for truth, you look for congruent messaging. And by that, we mean everything lines up. And what I would tell you to do, you should turn off the sound and watch the messaging, and then go back and listen to the sound and see where you see a deviation. There's not much here. What you're going to find, and this is what, what Scott just said, is it all lines up. All of his arrows are lining up. 
He does one request for approval where I'm asking you to approve. And it's not about whether it happened or not. It was like, do you believe that? When he said that there's not enough PPE to go around. That's the only time I saw it. If you pay attention to everything he says, he, first of all, go back and look at the MP who was talking to him and watch what he does. Exactly what I call browbeating. You are aware of what you're saying, right? That's browbeating. And he's like, certainly I'm aware, but his hands do go up in front of his mouth a little bit. He's aware of the gravity of what he's saying. And then his cadence, his brow, his words, his eyes, his eye contact, all of those things are delivering the message he's delivering. And when Mark talks next, I'm going to say, well, if this guy is not telling the truth as he sees it, he should have been an actor because yeah. his message is pretty tight. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, no, it's amazing what you can, you know, you don't need to know specifically what's happening here uh, in order to get to the real nub of what's going on. Here's, here's what I think uh, that you've hit on there. Uh, Greg Clark here is playing the role, I think, of the kindly headmaster who is who is saying uh, to, to Dominic, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to roll this one back because of the gravity. I'm going to give you the opportunity to just roll it back and say, hey, when I said lie, I was maybe exaggerating. Let me just step that one back. So what Clark does is lean forward, as you're saying, Greg, he, he takes this roll of the browbeater and, and kind of goes, do you want to roll this one back? And, and Cummings goes, no, not really. I think I think I'll go ahead with this one. So he says, what's your evidence of that? You see Cummings, his hand rises up, it floats up and then he takes a big amount of of space, rather like saying there is a hot air balloon of stuff that I could bring to this. Where should I start on on this one? And so he widens widens his whole body to this to this status figure in front of him who's also he is of high status but he's also played something of the role of the kindly uncle the kindly headmaster comply roll this back um now what happens is 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 that is that cummings delivers a bunch of evidence which could be seen as hearsay essentially and so clark goes well is this all you've is this all you've got is that the best you can do well uh, Cummings comes back with, no, I got a whole story which is corroborated by a cabinet secretary who is who is a civil servant, a top civil servant, and it's not their job to make stuff up. It's not their job to ha have any allegiance to one side or the other. It's their job to search for the truth and do the job accurately for the British public. And so... What's brilliant about this piece, and go back and look at Greg Clark's face at the start and how he stumbles through this, because I believe he was hoping that Cummings would roll back on this, and Cummings just keeps on coming until I think by the end of it, Clark, is, Clark wishes he hadn't gone down this route, because now we have the name of a top civil servant who will corroborate evidence. Uh, on this of a government minister in the cabinet directly lying. That's that's a big piece. Lying cabinet, it just puts the whole the whole of Britain at risk when that happens. But Chase, what, what do you see? What do you got? I was fascinated by something in this video for like 25 minutes this morning. The woman behind him has a relatively new notebook she has now flipped it over, is writing on the last page, and it's also upside down. I want to know what the hell is being written or scribbled inside of that final page of this new notebook. Because I want to know what makes a person flip the last page and then flip it over. I thought that was fascinating. Completely unrelated and absolutely irrelevant. I thought you were going to go with uh, the mask thing with her when it's on, then it's off, then it's on, then it's off. That that's where you were going with it. Yeah. So, okay, I, sorry. I thought that was unusual as well. Yeah. She's just starting the next chapter, Chase. She's heading back in the other direction. <laughs> She's got so much to work with. <laughs> so he is taking up a lot of space, showing some dominance, but he's also got his hand on his hip. Mm -hmm. And 
he's doing that. I can't necessarily tell whether his thumb is facing backward or forward, but typically somebody's thumbs are forward. They're more curious about what's going on in front of them. Thumbs backward typically indicates a little more dominance. And the first person to ever really write about this was a guy named Julius Fast and Desmond Morris and the book actually right up here called Gestures. And they called this, the first name that this was given was the anti-embrace posture to make sure no one could come and, and hug you and get close to you. Uh, so I think that was, it's a very great move, whether it was deliberate or not, I don't really care. Uh, and I think it was a, a natural behavior for him right there. I don't think it was a calculated maneuver. And there's more disaster over the PPE. There's horrific circumstances. So we're starting to see almost a sales pitch or a fictional account of where we're hearing these words that we might see in a movie or a movie trailer to where we were vividly imagining something because the adjective is so powerful. Not that any of this is fiction. He is probably just such a compelling speaker and communicator that this stuff comes across. None of these things per se are deceptive in nature or suggest deception is present barring any other behavior that's that's there even scoring this on the behavioral table of elements he would score an eight and a half for this entire thing i mean you need an 11 to be graded as likely deceptive the baton gestures are over overall perfectly on point mostly honest and direct and i was the last one yeah that was it. Right. in accusing the health secretary of having lied um, did i hear that correctly yes um, can you, that's obviously a serious charge, can you provide the committee with the, the evidence behind that assertion? Yes, I mean, um, in, in, uh, there, are, there are numerous examples. I mean, in the summer, he said that everyone who needed treatment, who uh, got the treatment that they required, he knew that that was a lie because he'd been briefed by the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer himself about the first peak. And we were told explicitly people did not get the treatment that they deserved. Many people were left to die in horrific circumstances. Is that the basis of your assertion? Are there other pieces? Oh, sorry? Of, is that the basis of your assertion or are there other um, pieces of evidence that you base that, that charge on? Just before the Prime Minister and I were diagnosed with having COVID ourselves, the Secretary of State for Health told us in the Cabinet room, everything is fine on PPE. We've got it all covered, etc., etc. When I came back, almost the first meeting I had in the Cabinet room was about the disaster over, over PPE and how we were actually completely sure that hospitals all over the country were running out. The Secretary of State said in that meeting, this is the fault of Simon Stevens, it's the fault of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, it's not my fault, they've blocked approvals on all sorts of things. I said to the Cabinet Secretary, please investigate this and find out if it's true. The Cabinet Secretary came back to me and said, it's completely untrue. I have lost confidence in the Secretary of State's honesty in these meetings. The Cabinet and Secretary said the that. The Cabinet Secretary said that to me and the Cabinet Secretary said that to, 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 to the Prime Minister. Okay. So that's how the day started off with us thinking, okay, today is going to be all about all, all about about COVID and whether or not we're going to uh, announce the household quarantine. We then got completely derailed because um, in the morning of the 12th, suddenly the national security people came in and said, Trump wants us to join a bombing campaign in the Middle East tonight. And we need to start having meetings about that through the day with COBRA as well. So everything to do with COBRA that day was on COVID was completely disrupted because you had these two parallel sets of meetings. You had the national security people running in and out talking about, are we going to bomb the Middle East? And we had the COVID, the COBRA meeting being delayed and whatnot as we were trying to figure out, are we going to do household quarantine? Um, and then to add to the, it sounds so surreal, it couldn't possibly be true. That day, the Times had run a huge story about the Prime Minister and his girlfriend and their dog. And the Prime Minister's girlfriend was going completely crackers about this story and demanding that the press office deal with that. So we had this sort of completely insane situation in which part of the building was saying, are we going to bomb Iraq? 
Part of the building was arguing about whether or not we're going to do quarantine or not do quarantine. The Prime Minister has his girlfriend going crackers about something completely trivial. All right, Chase, what do you got? We can see that he is painting a picture here to look like a circus. He wants you to imagine a circus freak show of stuff going on here. Think of the difference. He starts saying a bombing campaign in the Middle East, but then once he's inside the building and talking about what all is going on, it's just bomb the Middle East. That Those are two very, very different things. Bombing campaign in the Middle East or bomb the Middle East. So now once he's inside, it's more drastic, more uh, catastrophic uh, description there. And I think his his head touching when he's touching his head, stress and confusion, which, according to me, matches his story. And he spits out the name Trump and never failed to say prime minister when he's talking about the guy that he's, you know, bashing right now. And still says his title. I thought that was interesting. Good data point. I, I don't know anything else about the guy. So it's just a data point for me that I would ask about in the conversation. He uses another negative adjective here when he says disrupted. And if I see negative body language that someone's reliving something negative and they use the adjective, that becomes more powerful. I know that adjective will be more powerful later on in the conversation. And he, let's see. So I think that what he's doing is with his hands is trying to, he's reliving, trying to arrange all of the stuff that's going on. He's really thinking about this little board of all the things that he's got to move around. And when he says the times had a story, he goes to his negative side, his left side, the times. Remember he puts positive stuff over here. He says the times ran a story. He's referencing this side of his body. Another great data point to kind of, maybe uh, shine a little light on what he thinks about the media outlet or the article itself. Um, Greg. So he starts off telling this story and when he touches his brow, I think his touching his brow is like, okay, this is not even going to sound real. I think there's a little bit of concern as to do I blow yeah. my whole story when I tell these details, but he does touch his brow. He's making dual eye contact. And I think you said this earlier, Mark, but he's making eye contact with two or more people and he's trying to keep that. It's not because he's rifling through his brain or any of that kind of thing. His illustrators hit his story in exactly the right places with the exception of reaching for his brow. There's no pause to ask for approval. There's no brow up even when he's telling you the crazy stuff. So to me, this says congruent. This says, hey, the story is rolling. This is exactly what happened. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this guy is a problem solver, which we've already we've already shown. We've already talked about at this point. Um, and the reason is because when he's he talks about thinking, he says we're thinking or the situation where he's, where he's talking about thinking. Then he goes on to to explain these problems he's dealing with. And I think when his hand goes to his head, it's like any other time when you're trying to think about something. What was that kid's name? I can't remember. what the. So I think that's what it's about it is it. I, I believe it is an adapter. But at the same time, he's he's. He, he's flashing back to thinking about all these things that were spinning around at once, because at the end of this, when he goes on to using his hand, he's showing the things piling up as we go along. As, as the story goes on, he's, he's piling things up and showing that pile when somebody did this and she was this and the, the, the dog and all this stuff. So as you go, as we go along. So I think he's a problem solver. And this is part of the we're, we're seeing part of this, the structure of how he solves problems. He sees things in, in groups, he sees things in generalities, then he starts getting down to specifics as you normally would. And I think we're seeing him do that body language wise. And his, his uh, illustrators, uh, he starts adding them on like he did before, like he did earlier. He starts adding them on, they start getting bigger and he gets down to hitting specific words and phrases as he goes from generalities down into specifics. When Trump would, would make something specific, what he would do, that's, that's why he would always do that. He would say that he's pinpointing that uh, specific um, point he's making. He makes a point out of it, and that's why he was doing that. And I think we're seeing in his way doing this. He has did this in his way doing that um, uh, make as he makes specifics. And um, also, 
And he's relaying information again, and we know obviously he's relaying information, but this is how it looks when you're explaining a, a complex systems or how something is put together or a story. You're explaining it, something that happened. You'll go through and you'll use different spaces, and he does this this whole space thing. It's fascinating how he does it because he'll he'll use this, of course, as, as the future he comes to the past and works his way through those and does the piling up stuff so he's building this picture for your for your brain to see as you're as you're watching him so there's a lot going on there it helps keep your attention and um i think he's 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 leaning in to show and, and that shows us that and why i say lean when i say leaning in i mean he's he's putting all these things out uh, at a good volume in these big movements because he this happened i think he's relaying exactly what happened He's still trying. He, the structure may not be completely correct in the in the in the small parts of it, because you know, there's always things that scoot around in your in your mind when you're remembering things. But I think he's he feels so strongly about this. That's why he's getting he's he's working himself up to be uh, in, in his illustrators and his words as well as he's coming through. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think you're right. So I think what he's trying to do is keep control of this story because it is so outlandish for him. So I think he goes up into the into the ecstatic area, which is this idea of it's so energized, it's so beyond your own body that you start rising out of your body. We'll see him later on suppress in the ecstatic here, uh, but, in, but to keep control of it, I think then he starts self-stimulating here i think just like you're saying there scott it's to he's not going to let it rise out of here or he'll lose control of the whole story and it will become so outlandish because he'll start describing it in an ecstatic outlandish way he's got to nail it down in some way so i think he nails it down uh his exasperation and the extraordinary nature of it he nails it down here uh we do see a sour taste on the on the bombing raid element and and later on in this whole piece uh, he does say later on that that he thought uh rightly or thankfully that the bombing raid get you know uh being part of that bombing raid uh, uh deciding not to be part of it was in his view a good idea so he indicates uh, uh right from that moment that he has distaste for the idea of that particular idea um maybe not as a generality but that particular idea at that time was not uh for him um uh, but by the way just so people know he ke he's, keeps talking about cobra that's not a that's not a snake that's the cabinet office meeting rooms which have a very high security and are pretty much a faraday cage so you can't get any communications in or out it's a bit tricky to 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 use it um but just so you know what he's talking about is the most secure place for a government official to be and and talk so again he's putting down we were in this super high ranking super secure place and we've got and so what happens in his descriptors uh there uh, you know his illustrators are really describing the jostling for position of is it is it the british people and and covid or is it trump and the bombing raid the the people trump like which way are we gonna go so you get a bit of that and then he walks it forward a little bit going okay we're gonna walk this forward and and then down here comes the prime minister's girlfriend and the dog down here and so you've got this lovely illustration clear illustration of how everything is jostling for position and ranking and the surreal nature of the times and the and the and the prime minister's girlfriend and and the dog um but having said all of that all of it wholly congruent though outlandish all of it completely congruent and i think you know this is one of the most extraordinary moments of this whole you know, seven hours we, we're not showing you the whole seven hours of this this cabinet debrief um but he is in his mind showing you the surreal and bizarre world of the the most important decision makers in the uk making the most important de decisions and exactly the surreal nature of what went on in this instance and from the look of it 
it's entirely credible. This in his mind is exactly what happened and, the, and exactly the way it rolled out for him. There, that's what I got on that one. Right, cool. So that's how the, the day started off with us thinking, okay, today is going to be all about, all, all about, about COVID and whether or not we're going to uh, announce the household quarantine. We then got completely derailed because um, in the morning of the 12th, suddenly the national security people came in and said, Trump wants us to join a bombing campaign in the Middle East tonight. And we need to start having meetings about that through the day with COBRA as well. So everything to do with COBRA that day was on COVID was completely disrupted because you had these two parallel sets of meetings. You had the national security people running in and out talking about, are we going to bomb the Middle East? And we had the COVID, the COBRA meeting being delayed and whatnot as we were trying to figure out, are we going to do household quarantine? Um, and then to add to the, it sounds so surreal, it couldn't possibly be true. That day, the Times had run a huge story about the Prime Minister and his girlfriend and their dog. And the Prime Minister's girlfriend was going completely crackers about this story and demanding that the press office deal with that. So we had this sort of completely insane situation in which part of the building was saying, are we going to bomb Iraq? Part of the building was arguing about whether or not we're going to do quarantine or not do quarantine. The Prime Minister has his girlfriend going crackers about something completely trivial. We good? Yep. yep. As I said, we said on the 14th, we are going to have to lock down. We are going to have to get there as soon as we possibly can. All of the... Uh, the you are being shown... So we'll come back to the, to the kind of logic. The basic answer to your question is, yes, on the 14th, we said to the Prime Minister, you are going to have to lock down. But there is no lockdown plan. It doesn't exist. SAGE haven't modelled it. DH don't have a plan. We are going to have to figure out and hack together a lockdown plan. So it wasn't so much that you rejected your advice. It was just that we weren't physically ready to proceed on that basis and, and we needed longer to work up how you would do things like that. Is that is that the broad picture? Sort of. Essentially, the Prime Minister, quite reasonably, you know, this was like, imagine, you know, this is like a scene from Independence Day with Jeff Goldblum saying the aliens are here and your whole plan is broken and you need a new plan, right? That is what the scene was like that morning with Ben Warner in the Jeff Goldblum role. He took the Prime Minister through all the graphs and through the NHS graphs and showed him the system is thinking that this is all weeks and weeks and weeks away. You'll be shown all of these graphs about time to peak of the epidemic in June, but this is all completely wrong. Uh, Greg, what do you got? I know I'm going to say this over and over and over, but congruent messaging matters. Everything he's saying ties, his hands are illustrating, you know, and when we say that, we, it's punctuating what he's thinking. His illustrators are going at the right time. If you pay attention and you compare him to the other guy who is asking the question, who has no reason to be incongruent, they're almost identical. Their hands are moving at the right times. They're, they're delivering the right message. He seems passionate to clarify these points. If you notice, he leans in. And I don't mean leans in like trying to get small. He's leaning in, paying attention, good eye contact, moving his eyes when he can. But he's also driving that point. I think at one point it looks like his legs are almost curled back in the chair as he's leaning in to answer the question. He's trying to get the information forward. He's answering the questions in the same way the guy's asking. It looks congruent. I'll leave it at that. And Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think it, one thing that happens if I tell you that it was just like a scene from a movie that you've seen is I've, I don't even need to describe anything. I've instantly manufactured the tone the feeling, the, the, the tone in the room where there's one smart guy and a bunch of idiots. I don't need to say any of that. I've manufactured that in your brain just by borrowing from one of your memories. And he does a great job at doing this. Not that that's deceptive at all, but that's the hallmark of, of great communication is knowing how I can shortcut uh, describing something and making your brain visualize it and put yourself there. And I think a lot of what he's doing here in his leaning back and sitting up straight is he's finally getting ready. He's 
he's getting more comfortable with shining a, a really bright light in a very dark spot. And I think that's starting to show some of his confidence as he said, okay, I'm, I'm, I've already left the gate. I'm, I'm out now and, and I'm, I'm actually doing this. And I don't think any of this is a, is a reduction. Any of the storytelling is a reduction of credibility. Uh, Mark. Yeah, so I think I think you're right. Good pick up there on the on the film reference because what Cummings is traditionally very very good at is finding the popular currency to connect with the public. And I think you know you've picked up there on a really good example of him of him laying down an idea that most people are going to get. I mean, who hasn't seen that film? Uh, even if you haven't seen the whole film, you've seen that that moment. And even if you haven't seen it in that film, you've seen it in all the other films, which that film took that moment from just as you said, Chase, the smart guy who walks in when everything is crumbling and goes, Hey, you got it all wrong. Uh, let me bring you the piece of intelligence now that 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 helps on this. So good call on that one. Uh, we see a lot of uh, gestures from him, but all congruent, suppressive gestures, uh, detailed gestures like you were talking about there, Scott, compartmentalization gestures, even where he goes, yeah, I'll come back to the logic of it in a moment and 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 moves that to one side, uh, deletion, deletion gestures, wipe clear gestures. Um, even he, he, he plays the presentation of the data as well and uses, uses a prop. So great storytelling, uh, from, from him. Um, you know, I'd love to know what's going on in Jeremy Hunt's eyes at that point um because because jeremy hunt is is wide-eyed and slightly targeted but not that narrow-eyed targeted i mean it's kind of it's jeremy hunt's it could be one of jeremy hunt's jobs right now to attack and take down cummings and i think he's leading to that but instead of being targeted he is a little wide-eyed and and psychotic there i would suggest uh scott what do you got there all right i'm gonna go back i'm gonna agree with all you guys this guy's a great communicator this is this is really good and going to to everybody's points on what he's doing visually you know we talk about uh when it comes to communication a couple of shows ago we talked about how someone is either visual they'll be an audio person or they'll be a kinesthetic person as they reference uh, situations, people, things, as they explain things. For example, for um, audio, you know, that sounds good to me. I hear what you're saying. They'll catch words and uh, catch things in those terms. The kinesthetic person will say, oh, that, uh, I, that makes me feel this way. I feel it would be this. She's a little rough around the edges, but, you know, she's, but she's usually, you know, um, smoother as things go along. And then you have the visual person who talks about things that, that from a visual perspective, they'll talk about colors, they'll say, or they'll say oh, that shirt's a little bit, um, they'll compare their, the same way, yeah, I see what you're saying, looks good to me, that looks like something we would do. In this case, he's using pictures over and over and over as he continues to build this picture from, from a physical point of view for you as it goes through. And that's really great communicators like Steve Jobs did this as well. He would compare things. He would take things like um, coffee. He would take, say it would be, you know, it's like having nine lattes. You could have this for, you know, 23 lattes or 23 cups of coffee. And that's what he's doing is comparing the, the movie to a real life situation. And you're right, Chase, that pop, instantly pops you right in that thing. It's perfect. It's a perfect analogy yeah. as well. Um, yeah. So I think he's, uh, I, again, I, I see all truthful here. I don't see any, any, there's no chink in his armor as far as being truthful here. I think he's coming straight on and it's just, it, you're, he's decided he's, after he's out of the gate, like Chase said, he's coming full on. He's like, I'm in, I've already jumped. You know, you, once you jump off a, a, a cliff, you don't sort of kind of jump off. You either jumped or you didn't. And this guy jumped and he's, and he's getting ready to hope that chute opens up as he, as he's fallen. So, and he must have one somewhere. So he must wear, know where some bodies are buried or something, because this is a pretty ballsy statement. I mean, the things he's saying against, against the people who are running everything over there. So, but I think he's telling the truth. I think I don't see any deception whatsoever. As I said, we said on the 14th, we are going to have to lock down. 
we are going to have to get there as soon as we possibly can. All of the, uh, the, the you are being shown. So we'll come back to the, to the kind of logic. The basic answer to your question is yes. On the 14th, we said to the prime minister, you are going to have to lock down, but there is no lockdown plan. It doesn't exist. Sage haven't modelled it. DH don't have a plan. We are going to have to figure out and hack together a lockdown plan. So it wasn't so much that you rejected your advice. It was just that we weren't physically ready to proceed on that basis and, and we needed longer to work up how you would do things like that. Is that is that the broad picture? Sort of. Essentially, the Prime Minister, quite reasonably, you know, this was like, imagine, you know, this is like a scene from Independence Day with Jeff Goldblum saying the aliens are here and your whole plan is broken and you need a new plan, right? That is what the scene was like that morning with Ben Warner in the Jeff Goldblum role. He took the Prime Minister through all the graphs and through the NHS graphs and showed him the system is thinking that this is all weeks and weeks and weeks away. You're being shown all of these graphs about time to peak of the epidemic in June, but this is all completely wrong. All right. We good on that one? Yep. I'm terribly sorry that I didn't do it earlier, but it just seemed like such a massive thing to, it was almost, it was almost surreal, the whole experience. And, it, and part of what me and Ben, you know, on the, on the Friday night we were doing this, and then the next morning when there was this kind of the Jeff Goldblum scene with Ben explaining things, the whole thing just seemed like a kind of out of control movie. And, in retrospect, it's clear that we should have acted earlier, but right. but at, at the time. All right, all right, um, all right, Greg. What do you got? So I'm I'm going to be short on this one again. His hands are rising. He goes through this whole thing asking for approval when he says, "I'm I'm terribly sorry." You get a little bit of the grief muscle, a little bit of the sides of the mouth nodding, and the uh, sides of the mouth dropping and the nodding is getting it out. You know, when people are talking and they're trying to get something out, often they'll do that. It's what I see. You may see something different, but that asking for approval and then his hands go up on his head. Chase, I don't know what we do anymore. It's been a long time since I've been in the business, but when you rescue <laughs> hostages, we put their hands on their heads so we know where their hands are at all times. And I call that the hostage rescue. At, you, know, you get to a point of helplessness, you, your hands are in the air. Mark, you're gonna have a much more eloquent term for it than I do. But if I'm like, and I'm suddenly thinking, what the hell am I doing with my hands in the air? I find a place to put them. That's hostage rescue. That's helplessness to me. And I think he's probably realizing, hey, I'm losing some credibility by it being this late for me to come out and say this. So better answer. I, look, I don't think the guy's 100% above board, not worried about other people. I'm just telling you that he's telling his story as he remembers it in, in today's words, his truth. And then he's at a point where he's got to do something with those hands. That's what I see. Um, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, well, he goes, we see him again going back to that first apology video. Same um, setup there. He's, he's, he's calm. He's small. Not a whole lot of, of illustrators going on there. No illustrators really at the top. He's got that soft tone of voice as he goes through. And then again, like you said, Greg, a hint of that grief muscle. And then... When you see videos where something's gone wrong and you're helpless, and this goes back to what you said, Greg, you can't do anything about it. If you watch those 9-11 videos, when you'll see people hit the, the planes hit the building, or the plane hit the building, you'll see their hands go on top of their head. If you'll see someone make one of those basketball shots from a long shot and they're all waiting. Oh, no, they made it. Same thing in American football. You know, if somebody intercepts and it's like at the, whatever the crit critical moment would be, but you have an interception, you'll see hands go right to the head as well. That just shows I can't do anything about this. I'm helpless in that. Hands go to the head. I think that's what he's, I think he's feeling that there as he goes through that. And um, I, I, don't think, I don't think they're rehearsed. And I'm not seeing, Greg, I, I, what you're saying where he may not be as, as honest about that. Maybe he's more concerned with himself at this point than those other people. What oh, I mean say? motivation. I'm not talking about whether oh, he's oh, being okay. honest in what he's saying. Okay, yeah. okay, I got you, I got you. Um, so I'm not seeing, again, mine short because I'm not seeing anything um, out, out, of, out of what we've seen so far. Everything just seems perfect with what's happened so far. I believe him. And I believe he was being truthful and don't see any, any, even a little bit of deception at all. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I want to call this the uh, Chris Watts salute. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, that's what we're seeing. 
he felt absolutely helpless. You need to be in marketing, man. I'm telling you, you need to be in marketing. I know I tell you that all the time. And advertising. You're in the wrong spot, dude. (laughs) You got to do that. Let's talk about, hold on. I I, I agree. And I am kind of in marketing. (laughs) Yeah. I'm the marketing director of uh, the behavior panel. (laughs) There you go. So that's helpless. Chris Watts was helpless. And I think he's reliving this time in his life when he just felt helpless. I have noticed in my life during periods of helplessness, people will make self contact in places they might be insecure about. And I will notice that people, uh, especially men who are, who are bald are usually not self-conscious men who are losing their hair are self-conscious. So that becomes kind of a habitual thing to worry about that spot. That's my observation. I've never seen it in a single piece of research, not saying it's accurate. Uh, I don't think uh, anything is deceptive here. This is self-soothing behavior, and I think it's behavior that is reflective of the present or the, yeah, the recall, recalling that emotion in the present moment. And everything else uh, is a little bit exaggerated, but I think that's part of his communication style where he is selling the story. And when I say selling, that doesn't mean I'm delivering a load of crap. When I say selling, that means if I'm good parent, I can sell, you need to get your homework done. If I'm a good anything communicator, I can sell, I can sell an idea. And that's what he's doing. Cool. Sorry. Uh, Mark, Mark, what do you got? Okay, so to your point, Greg, uh, I would categorize what he's doing here as a suppressive gesture in the ecstatic plane. And it would denote to me extreme loss, which is what you see when, you know, they, you know, the team gets a goal and then the referee disallows the goal. Everybody goes, ah, you know, and because it's an extreme loss. And just as, as Scott was saying there, there's nothing you can do about it. And so you've got to keep your head, you've got to keep your head on. It's so such an extreme loss. You've literally got to bolt your head uh, back down. Sometimes you'll see people eye block and turn right away. They can't even look at the loss. It's so extreme. Uh, I, th- I think what he's talking about here is is the loss to the British public. This is a question around should he have advised the prime minister to lock down earlier? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, not ironic, it's odd that, that, you know, Cummings is an unelected advisor by choice of the Prime Minister, and the select committee are going, do you know what, do you think you should have been a better unelected advisor, uh, and friend to the Prime Minister? I'm not sure, I'm not sure that that's, that that's really the point uh, here, because you know, the elected officials should be, the, the, the decision should be coming down to them. But ultimately, they're saying, could you have done a better job here, Dominic? And he is, there's emotion in his voice, there's suppression here, and he is saying, yeah, I, I regret it, I, I could have done a better job uh, here. And he's trying to keep his, his head on uh, around this. It's an extreme gesture. You rarely see this gesture. You'll see it a lot at sports games, um, but you rarely see it in any conversation with anybody. I mean, think about it. You think about it. When was the last time you saw another human being, apart from our show today with you, when did you last see that gesture? You don't walk out on the streets and see that gesture every day. Now, it is used, you know, often as a stress device as a submissive device when I was at school you know if you weren't if you were being a little bit errant a little bit naughty a little bit cheeky uh headmaster headmistress would say okay put your hands on your head Bowden and face the wall so uh and that was the way of of I would face the wall and and plan evil ways to get back at the headmaster and the headmistress that's just me for others it was a little more more suppressive it's hard to plan like this it's hard to turn to your friends <laughs> and go should we get a should we get a plan together guys you know everybody it's just tough to do a lot of the usual thinking that you might want to do and a lot of the the dexterous actions that you want to do if you're like 
this. So we don't see it often. That's why it's so extraordinary to see this. That's why in the British papers, that image there was one of the big images around this particular interview. I think it's about extreme loss. You know what I thought of? The first thing I thought of when you were talking about that is on Wheel of Fortune, when somebody hits the little bankrupt uh, triangle thing, and they're like, oh, God. Yeah. You can always <laughs> see it there. Yeah. <laughs> Watch video of like stock market tumbles, and you'll see it. Yeah. Traders yeah. on the floor. Yep. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, they've been trading right up here in the heat of right. it, yep. right in the ecstatic, uh, the ecstatic zone, and then, ah, the market crashes. Terrible. Is everybody? Is everybody? Scott frozen. He's pretending to freeze. <laughs> I just kidding. <laughs> that was really it was good. good for that a was bit. good. It was good for a bit. Uh, thanks. I'm terribly sorry that I didn't do it earlier, but it just seemed like such a massive thing. To it was almost it was almost surreal the whole experience, and it and part of what me and Ben, you know, on the on the Friday night we were doing this. And then the next morning when there was this kind of the Jeff Goldblum scene with Ben explaining things, the whole thing just seemed like a kind of out of control movie. And in retrospect, it's clear that we should have acted earlier, but, but at, at the time, there you go. quite a few people around Whitehall who thought that the real danger here was the economy. Um, the Prime Minister's view throughout um, January, February, March was uh, as he said in many meetings, the real danger here is not the disease. The real danger here is the measures that we take to deal with the disease and the economic destruction that that will cause. Um, he had that view all the way through. All right, Greg, what do you got? I think this is, I could sum this up quite simply. He's looking down at the monitor, but he's saying, hey, here's my head. Go ahead and take it. That's what I see in all of that body language. Mark, what do you see? <laughs> yeah, so uh, here's what I see is, is uh, I don't know how many hours is into this now, but he's, he, he's probably about four hours in uh, to the debrief at this point. So he's getting a bit tired. Um, he's, he's tired and he can't even hold his own head up. But there is something in that holding your head gesture, which is synonymous i think with deflation desolation things being bleak and things being dismal and so it does fit with his bleak and dismal story of now he's talking about boris the prime minister and the idea of uh, boris um thinking more about economy than people, more about money than people. And I think either consciously or unconsciously, he's wishing us to get the, the, the physical representation of, isn't that a desolate idea? Isn't that a dismal and bleak idea that your leader would care more about economy than he, he does about you? I think that's what he's trying to get across. But I can't say at this point whether it's conscious or unconscious. It also could be unconscious because he's just tired by now. And it, it's it's an inference that I can take um, from that. If you look at some of Blake's, um, yeah, I think it would be Blake's uh, etchings of the fall from heaven. That's that's Lucifer falling from heaven. By the time he's hit Earth, been cast out from Earth, he's he's like this on the Earth, going, "God, that was a bad decision to go up against God on that one. That really was. I wish I could take that one back." So you know, there's some, and so I'll end up inferring all kinds of things that I've seen from from all over the place to this. He could just be tired. In, in this particular instance. But Chase, what, what do you think? What do you got? Yeah, there's not there's not a lot of facial movement or facial expressions to suggest that this is guilt or shame or anything else. And there's, I think it's a self-soothing behavior. It's self-contact, self-referential contact. I think it's self-soothing. It's a pacifying behavior. And this is the, the message of all politicians. And, and I'm not saying it's false, but it's, I tried... We made mistakes. They screwed up. And that's that's kind of the message overall here. And and all we're seeing here, I think this is honest. I think he's being 
forthright and forthcoming about most of this stuff, but I do think there is absolutely a narrative associated with there's a, there's a desired outcome here that that is coming through. Scott, all right. I agree with all of y'all. I think we're everybody's hit a hit a, a specific part of of this looking at the same thing. This is why this is interesting. It's because we all see something from a different angle, or which is pretty much the same thing, but we word it differently. We add stuff to it. And in this case, I think what we're seeing is a combination of him being tired and the can you can you believe this? The the part with his, with his hand on the side of his face when you go, I I can't believe what's happening. That kind of thing as he's resting. But at the same time, when he's talking about the problems being solved, he's going to that section on his head that he did earlier. And he's got his hand on there. But everybody in here, I, I believe we all, even though we're all, all of our takes on that are a little bit different. That's that's my, from my perspective. What I'm saying it's a combination of I can't believe it and still trying to work through it and solve the problem or whatever. Let's go back to that stuff that was on his hand. So, Chase, you thought you think it's ink? I do think it's ink because I, I was wondering what it was. So I went back to the entire thing. And mm -hmm. I kind of just dragged the YouTube slider over until I saw the black mark uh, show up. And he's kind of holding his pen. My pencil's really short, but he's he's holding his pen kind of like that and and fiddling with it back and forth. So I think that's ink from that from that pen of his. Okay, yeah, because what else could it be? I can't imagine. Quite a few people around Whitehall who thought that the real danger here was the economy. Um, the prime minister's view throughout um, January, February, March was, uh, as he said in many meetings, the real danger here is not the disease. The real danger here is the measures that we take to deal with the disease and the economic destruction that that will cause. Um, he had that view all the way through. All right, let's move along. What we ended up arguing was in fact, if you try not to lock down and you try to uh, you try and optimize for the short term economy, you won't actually even get that because what will happen is the public will lock themselves down because they'll realize that there isn't going to be any, any NHS for anybody. That was the reality. And I think this point is even now is constantly lost in the scenario that we were heading for. Not only would you have had hundreds of thousands of deaths from covid, you would then have had absolutely no NHS at all for anybody. Your seven-year-old daughter falls over and needs A&E, there is no A&E for her. You got cancer treatment, there is no cancer treatment. Nothing. All right. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so on the fact is we see him come what I would call straight down the wheel plane, so right down his center line, combine all of the the points of view together and bring it to this this consideration that uh, the way that people wanted to go was the wrong way and they hadn't understood that uh, the ramifications of of the intervention, which is the nature of behavior, which is whatever you're thinking of doing to intervene and cause the change, chances are you have no idea what that is actually going to actually going to do. So, so, you know, he speaks something to the, the chaos of behavioral interventions and you see him coming down that wheel, wheel plane to kind of hold this thing together. Then we get these, th this incredible devastation gesture, flattening gesture of uh, absolutely no NHS, that's the National Health Service, which for the British is a, the UK is um, a, a, a pinnacle of achievement. It's something that the, 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 the British society has really attached itself to as, as a huge achievement, something which is uh, important and uniquely British, whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, it would be true to say, you know, the, the NHS is a, is a, is a, an icon. And so what he's saying is the complete destruction of a British uh, icon. And what he's doing is attaching that destruction to Boris Johnson. And so that's quite a big maneuver, maybe not a bold maneuver for Dominic Cummings, because he is a bold communicator and, and a bold politician. This is this is the person who can work out the way to extract 
the UK from Europe. That's a big move. That's a big move. You know, when you can undo what Churchill started, then that's quite a, a big thing uh, to do. So, uh, yeah, very, very bold storytelling there, bold gestures. But again, none of it incongruent. So none of it, in my mind, false uh, or inaccurate in his mind or a straight lie in his mind. I think he's telling us straight down the line, this is how I see it. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I agree with you 100 percent. We're seeing it. And it's a combination of everything we've seen up to this. We've seen up to this point because he's ending everything. He's bringing it all down to the end. I'm seeing nothing but but him being truthful. I don't see him deceit in here at all. Nothing. I think he's just laying it out. That's the way it is. And now he's after gone through the emotions he's gone through to have to say this person is lying. I'm throwing people on the bus. I'm tattling on people. All those things and not knowing what's going to happen to him after this, which I don't know if it's been bad or not, if it's going to get bad for him. I think he's being completely, completely honest here. And I think that's scary to thinking all that was actually going on in a country that large and in the world. And it's just it kind of, it's kind of mind blowing when you think about it. But that's what I'm seeing, just a combination of everything thing together. So, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think it's. I absolutely agree with you guys. I do think one interesting point is that he spent the whole video talking about how he cannot make any predictions and we couldn't have made any predictions and spends this video talking about how he's predicting what would have happened or what could have happened with absolute certainty and conviction. He's very certain, very uh, convicted in, in what he's talking about. And he uh, he's absolutely being truthful. But I think he's also wanting you to visualize how catastrophic if we didn't do X, Y, Z, I want you to imagine dead children. I want you to imagine hundreds of thousands. I think that's literally the phrase, hundreds of thousands of people uh, dying. So it's a catastrophic. It's very, uh, very dramatic. And I absolutely agree. I think he is being truthful. I think he does believe all of this stuff. And there's no signs of deception here. Greg? <laughs> oh, sorry. The next time somebody Thanks. does that, don't say a word. Yeah. Don't say a word. Whoever it is, all of us, as a group, let's I, just I was, sit there and I was so profound it. for four for seconds. Thank you, Mark. Do it. Man, that, was, that would have been so good. Okay. Go ahead. In this entire thing, he has talked about catastrophe and destitution, all kinds of strong language, but he has not been emphatic with his body language like he is with his hands here. And he's driving home the point that that failure of the national health system would be the most catastrophic possible thing. And that's believable because it's congruent with his messaging. He's demanding, he's emphatic, his brow rises at a request for, un for approval around the un uncertainty, uncertainty and helplessness of this whole thing. And it all comes together so that he turns his face down into his right in what we would call an emotional kind of a glance. All of this messaging is congruent. Whether, like I said earlier, I don't know his motivation, not important. What I can see is the messaging is truth from his angle, whatever that is. As I watch this whole thing, I see an entirely congruent message from, from this entire thing. And then an emphatic message at the worst possible thing that could happen because the economy and these other things, to your point, Mark, would not be nearly as big a failure as hundreds of thousands of people dying or your national health system falling apart. That's it. Congruent messaging. Excellent. What we ended up arguing was, in fact, if you try not to lock down and you try to uh, you try and optimize for the short term economy, you won't actually even get that because what will happen is the public will lock themselves down because they'll realize that there isn't going to be any, any NHS for anybody. That was the reality. And I think this point is even now is constantly lost in the scenario that we were heading for. Not only would you have had hundreds of thousands of deaths from covid, you would then have had absolutely no NHS at all for anybody. Your seven-year-old daughter falls over and needs A&E. There is no A&E for her. You got cancer treatment. There is no cancer treatment. Nothing. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. And uh, Chase, tell them why. Our statistics are telling us 
that there's around a 61.8245% chance that you haven't subscribed to the channel. A lot of our videos are just like this, except they're mostly people who are not telling the truth. And we're going to show you exactly how to do that in your day-to-day -day conversations. If you click that subscribe button, it won't hurt a bit. All right. All right, fellas, this is a good one. And uh, I'll see you next time. Bye now. The behavior panel. That was good. It's good. I think was. the, uh, the, the yeah. British people will, will thank you for it. They'll enjoy that. I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know.